another company here in Brisbane that wasn't in the 3D printing space but wanted to get into that, so the opportunity uh, arose for that company, so we formed a partnership and the new company name is 3dprinting.com.au proprietary limited. With our brand new logo, you're the first people in Brisbane ever to see this logo, straight out of the wrapper, and in a couple of weeks' time, we'll even take our new website straight out of the wrapper and you'll be able to get some real good information. We're located in Newman Road, which is just around the corner, strategic to this place so that we can all just jump in the car and go around for a factory tour. So I'm going to talk to you about um, three projects that we've done over the last couple of years. Uh, first of them is um, Smart Bar and um, reverse engineering of a truck dashboard. And then one of our really good projects was um, Ucrest Mining, where we did the Cadia Valley operations for. So the Smart Bar project was um, a, a fairly large project for us. It was uh, very technically challenging. Um, we had to reduce the inventory of the company by 50% making their patterns for uh, casting of their shells for a rotational molding. And if you imagine the smart bars, you see them on the front of the um, Queensland ambulances. <coughs> Pardon me. If you see them on the front of the Queensland ambulances, they're a rotational molded plastic uh, bull bar. Um, very impact resistant. I think you can drive into a full uh, 44 gallon drum at 70 kilometres an hour and not uh, damage your car. So it um, doesn't do too much before for the uh, 44 gallon drum. But what they wanted to achieve was a rigid pattern with no machining, um, reduce their inventory by 50%. Previously, they had to CNC machine um, tooling board to make their patterns, and that meant that for each shell, there was two patterns made. So we made uh, one pattern for each side of the shell. <coughs> You'll see the patterns in our office um, and the rotational molded one when you go over there. So this is number two out of the um, rotational molded uh, shells. So it hangs up in our office there in uh, g um, You know, it's uh, fully rotational. It's a production item. Uh, the first one, I'm not sure what happened with the first one. There were some technical issues with it, but this was number two out of the, um, out of the mold. So we were pretty happy that that uh, smart bar was happy and they graciously sent us one. This is how we started to um, deal with the issue of slicing up the, um, the 3D CAD file in order to make it 3D printable. And you can see that there are lots of different cut lines coming through the model here in various sections. And we had to divide it up so that we put it into sections that were uh, of the size for the machine to print, but also didn't give us too much of a uh, uh, difficult part line when we're actually joining the sections together. So in the cutting operations, we use um, Magic's RP, and we use an advanced cut. You can see through here, some of the cut lines come through here, and it's more of a, uh, a tongue and groove type of uh, cut. It was very important to do that. It gave us um, a pre-alignment when we went to put the um, components together, so it made it easier for assembly. And the reason it is that when we uh, have 35 components that you're all trying to put together and measure and make sure that they fit together properly, uh, you don't have enough hands to actually hold everything together. With the cut operation here, you, we had to be very careful about uh, sloping angles because if you can see the cut line comes through at this point here, it's created a knife edge where this set, small triangular section would break off. So as uh, an alternative to that particular cut operation, we then developed this cut operation, which came more along parallel to the, the geometry of the part. And we're giving it about 0.1 or 0.2 millimeters uh, clearance all the way around. Now, if we do size for size, they're difficult to put together, but also there's no room for the glue. Uh, I think you can, you can see that when, when the sections come together like that, and you've got multiple sections coming together in different sections, uh, gluing one section together and another section in uh, assemblies and then trying to glue two assemblies together. Uh, it's a very difficult operation, so you need to have some alignments. A few things that we also added into the model were these posts, which were um, 20 millimeters long, and we knew the X, Y, Z coordinate of each particular post, so when we did the assembly, we were able to measure that with the barrel arm and the entire assembly was within 0.5 uh, 
not sure what the nine is, eight, 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 ten metres. So it was a pretty good um, outcome. So once we got it all cut, we print and we print and we print and we print and we print. Um, 35 or 32 sections per side, and they all need to be laid out onto the table, and um, then we start doing pre assembly. Pre assembly sort of looks a little bit like this. A uh, bit of tape, a bit of glue, a bit of soup glue, um, and then we measure it with the barrel and make sure that uh, everything was put together. And once we start getting things um, uh, aligned up and on a jig and they start taking shape, we end up with what you see is a shell pattern for a bull bar. Once we've got one side done, we start laying the inside to the main surface and then uh, continue to measure it up with the barrel and make sure our components are uh, right in position. So this is the front section of the, you're looking at the inside of the front section of the, um, the shell pattern there, and the guys are holding up. Uh, 65 kilos, it's a two, three person lift. We're a little bit paranoid about uh, lifting and moving around, but the geometry of the part was sufficient that it um, self-supported, so even if it was laying down on the floor, just um, straight onto the concrete, it self-supported and there was no issues with it. So, it was really a milestone for us to be able to produce a part on the 3D printer that was so accurate, so heavy, and so large as a monolith. It was one of the largest components I believe that's ever been done on the 3D printer anywhere in the world. I put it out on the net and no one's come back to me to say it's different. So this is the inside of the mating part, and you can see in the uh, pattern itself, it's got all the locations for all the screws, for the headlight bezels, um, pilot points for uh, drilling, and um, around the outside, this all gets drilled and clamped uh, in the pattern once it's been uh, cast and built together. So, in the end, it was quite a good project for Smart Bar. We did two of them. We did the Trident four wheel drive, which is that one, and the high as well. Uh, the next project that I'll talk to you about um, quickly is uh, reverse engineering of a truck dashboard. Um, we like to be challenged when we get into jobs. So uh, when one of our customers said, can you take the inside of a truck, scan it, reverse engineer it, 3D print it, and make uh, patterns for um, uh, casting uh, as a process, I said, well, theoretically, yes. I'm going to have to stop doing that, but um, <laughs> I said theoretically, yes, we can do that, and um, it was one of those uh, cases that, yes, we can do it, so let's have a go at it. Uh, again, they didn't want to have um, uh, machine tooling. The uh, quantity that they wanted to produce was quite low. It wasn't a high-speed manufacturing process, so it uh, was a case of breaking it down into the individual segments, scan the dash, reverse engineer it, change it from left hand to right hand to right, move a few of the controls in CAD, and then start 3D printing the, uh, the parts. So instead of using the z 3D printer, we use the SLA 500, and um, that was the right tool for the job to make those uh, patterns, because we wanted to use them for casting um, a particular type of resin over the top of them, and it gave us the flexibility to be able to do that. So again, this is how the, uh, the CAD design came to us. All right, so driver side column, uh, reverse of the dashboard. So the actual dash is, and driver's columns over this side, the glove box over there, you know, the um, cup holder is in the right spot, you know, one of the key things, make sure we can put the cup in the cup holder properly. Uh, so all the CAD was um, reverse engineered, and I think here we had uh, 28, I said 26, 27, and then this section was divided into two, so we had 28 components all done on the SLA. Um, once we've done all the components, then we've got to turn it into tooling, and part of the process is to uh, spray 10 coats of uh, PVA uh, mold release over the top of the part, and then we uh, use uh, aluminium epoxy over the top of the, um, the PVA, the PVA is a release agent. Um, we use a couple of coats of uh, what's called binding coat to give it some bulk behind the um, aluminium epoxy, and then we use a backing coat. Uh, backing material is the uh, red shape uh, LSH uh, 
LSA 68, I should know it well by heart. It is a very hard and durable material that you can build up very thick sections in the museum of your heart, and then you can attach jigs and fixtures to aid you in the manu um, handling of those particular uh, items. They do become heavy, uh, they are durable, and if you drop the mould on the floor, it's not going to break, but it's not like a, uh, a hard machine tool where it will crush your foot. Uh, so we like to do big. This is um, this is the dashboard install. Um, we're just running through, and you can see all the SLA components. They've all been done on the SLA after the CAD. And this is um, just a few more photographs. And these are the actual molded components. The moulded components were, it was a good thing to see these moulded components coming out of the moulds. It um, verified the actual process. When they fitted into the dashboard, uh, they all fitted together nicely with very minimal amount of adjustments. Um, in many ways, the finished component that we've uh, been able to achieve by this process looked a lot better than the components that were injection moulded and sent over on the original truck. The, the fit was much nicer, the surface finish was better, we were able to control it um, uh, to much tighter tolerances, and the interior of the dash, once finished, looked sensational. Better than OEM, and that was what the customers um, required to us. Better than OEM. The last project that I'll talk to you about just a moment is um, Newcrest Mining. And this was another real challenge for the company um, last year, year before last year, uh, where the company, which was Newcrest, wanted to have display their Katy Valley operations down in Orange, where they had a, uh, a couple of mines, surface mines, and then they had a couple of underground mines wanted to display for um, public consultation purposes their intention for the social license to operate so that they could um, show the, the, the current mining operations and how the mine would be regenerated um, and revegetated after their mining operations had finished in 25, 30 years time. Now it's a gold mine and uh, you know, typically gold mines are use a lot of toxic chemicals to extract the gold, but Eucharist has been um, developing their processes where they're actually not doing their ore processing on site anymore. They're refining their uh, ore down to a concentration, then they put it into a container and ship it offshore where it's going to be uh, processed offshore. So a lot of people don't have the opportunity to be able to see what happens in a gold mine. In any sort of mine, you know, they go, okay, mines, mines are bad places to be at, they're, they're dirty, there's a lot of um, heavy equipment, and they don't allow people to do tours of mines very often. So it was important for the stakeholders to be able to see what's happening on the site over the hill, and uh, this was a very good way of being able to do it. So we did a, a 3D mine, which is above ground, below ground, and we're from removal sections. So this is how the mine looks in cross-section. There's open cut in the middle, there's a sink, big sinkhole coming down through here where they're extracting from down the bottom, and they're going to do the same process down here, um, and this will become a big sinkhole underneath it, so that they come down to the bottom of the mine, extract the ore from the bottom, and the whole ore body collapses down on top of that, and they just keep shoveling the ore out to uh, extract it. So, that's okay, it looks okay in the picture, but no one really is able to understand that unless they're a mining engineer or they've been through the mine. Um, so we start with data that looks something like this. Uh, open cut, we've got um, extraction zones down the bottom. This is the ore body of the um, Cadia Valley. This is the ore body of Ridgeway, and these are all the roadways that lead in. There's ventilation shafts that come up to the top, there's conveyor belts that go up there, and there's uh, tailings dams over here and over here, and it's the tailings dams which cause people the most amount of problems in sensitive areas. So, 
the end result is a mind model that looks like this. It looks like this when we do it. it doesn't look like this when I'm doing it. So we start off um, dividing up all the sections and dealing with all the data. So this is the data set. And you can see the tail dams down the bottom. The open cut, uh, which way um, the cave-in zone over here. There's a um, stockpile of overburden over here. There's some other freshwater dams here. One of the things that we developed in this process was to be able to take out and remove the, the inserts were removable out of the mine and then they were replaceable with the um, revegetated sites. And this was one of the key advantages for this particular model. Once the, uh, these uh, inserts were taken out, this is what it looks like underneath. Right? So there's one, two, three, four, five sections to remove. And the trick was to be able to get those large 3D printed color sections out without breaking them uh, because they're quite thin, they're quite large, and people generally don't take too much care when they're taking things in and out of uh, mine models. So uh, we had to make them quite durable. When we did the rehab site, you can see the dams are now filled in, they're revegetated, um, the freshwater dams still in position. Uh, there's another dam up here as well that we had to um, remodel. So this is all revegetated site coming down through here. This is all farmland all the way around it. So the farmers, naturally enough, are concerned what's happening with their site, what's happening in their surrounding area, because they hear all the bad stories about you know, vegetation dying, groundwater being um, uh, toxic and they don't want that for their particular area. I used to live in Orange, I know this site quite, quite well. It's a, a very nice area, cold in winter. But um, you know, when they display the model at the um, Orange Agricultural Field Days, within the first 15 minutes of inviting the stakeholders in, 99% of the issues went away because the company was able to display what their intention was. And you can't fly people over sites all the time. It's expensive. This is a good way of being able to show people who are concerned what the intention of the company is. So these are the, um, the rehab uh, inserts. Exactly the same shape. They fit in with about 1.5 millimeters clearance. Uh, this is what they look at look like at the back. Um, this is the the ore extraction areas and the different colours denote the different types of ore and the, the amount of megatons that they're going to take out per round. And you can see the spaghetti. That's how we got the data on it. It's, um, it's amazing when you see a mine when it's designed in 3D. It's not um, geometrically correct. Nobody adheres to the vertice to vertice rule. You know, there's a tunnel going down there and then a tunnel coming onto the side. No one cares whether or not they meet up. Uh, but for our application, we have to ensure that they meet up. So all the red sections that you see here in Ridgeway are <coughs> issues with the file, and we have to correct those issues. So this is a looking underneath the model towards the um, Cadia Valley operations. And this is the ore body that you saw previously. And these are all the, the roadways and conveyors coming through here. This is Ridgeway in the background. Right. And what we used to model this was the, um, the clear watershed SLA material that we've got for our SLA 500. It was the perfect tool to do this particular job. Uh, another shot of it, we've installed lights and um, you, know, you can see all the cabling underneath it. Next one we'll do that a little bit differently. Uh, again, another view, and we've done cutaways <coughs> so that people can see inside the ore body to see the roadways that are all, and tunnels that have already been um, penetrated into the ore body and how that ore is going to be extracted. Just a few more photos. This is uh, Ridgeway and um, you can see some of the, the little cabling coming down through here. Um, this is a section yet to be mined and this is where they come down to at this stage. This particular section here has already been mined and has been going for over 20 years. If you remember the, the data that I showed you earlier with all the, um, the red inverted triangles from the uh, Ridgeway section with all the errors in it, 
This is how it looks like after we finish remodeling. So you can see inside the ore body, the roadways are all joined together, there's no gaps, there's no errors, and this is what we then 3D print. And this is a little video. So uh, when I drove this model down to, um, to Orange for their field days, I got down the, the night before, we worked 20 hours a day to try and get it finished, and um, I must admit I was pretty tired by the time I got in the van to, to drive it down. But um, I got down there at 6 o'clock at night, <coughs> and the field days were on the next day, so we didn't have much time to get it installed. So excuse the video footage, I am a tad tired, and I only have a little camera uh, with me. So what I'd like you to do is um, step into our high-speed helicopter, take a little journey with me over the top of um, Orange and Acadia Valley operations, and enjoy this little tour of the mine. So here you can see the inserts over the top, and we're flying up the, um, the valley towards the, um, the open cut pits just here, and then the ridgeway section is coming up here on the left. That's the caving zone. The comments from the mine engineers was looking into the pit is like looking into the pit, and that was good enough for me. We've got other sections here with LED lights that come and white pipes that uh, come up the top. There's an LED white pipe coming up through there. This is an entire removable section. <coughs> This section is removable, and this section is removable. There's another removable section just there. Um, the ridgeway section with the, some of the lights coming on the set. If I can find the button. There it is. And then the Cadia Valley sections with the different types of mining uh, activities uh, which are um, designated by different lights and there's a control panel on the front with um, tamper-proof buttons that we put in there so that um, you can uh, see or select the different areas of the mine, not only below ground but above ground as well. So we are 3D printing. Um, please join us, those people that are going to come up to the, uh, the site after um, the event today. Uh, happy to show you around. I think there's going to be two groups and um, so we we'll split them up evenly. And um, I think you'll enjoy some of the things, some of the more advanced type of 3D printing applications that um, we have on site at the moment. Uh, just a couple of announcements from 3D printing side of things. Um, we've just installed a large CMM machine, which we're currently commissioning. We're looking to um, buy a 3D laser scanner and an optical scanner in the future. And uh, finally, uh, Sarah talked about the SLM uh, type processes. We're currently trying to engage with uh, companies to get a premium on board to buy an SLM machine, bring it into Queensland. Now, we're looking at a million dollar price tag, so we're looking for those companies that have interest in SLM that want to partner with 3dprinting.com.au to share the cost of bringing that in. Metal printing. Metal printing, yes. Uh, we've got all the other technologies, I think we want to now as well. If there are people that are interested in it, or you know companies that are really talking about it, uh, please come and see me uh, later today, or you'll uh, get our contact details. Any questions? The uh, yeah, the, the clear that you're printing for the lower ground is yep. how optically clear, like if you were to do a vertical white surface, how optically clear is that? When you polish it, it can be optically clear, it's like a lens. Yeah, so when we polish it, we'll um, go up in grades of, um, of paper and uh, 
think we'll finish off at 2,000 and then we'll use uh, polished polisher. Um, you mentioned the MPE, you're planning on buying some 3D scanning and then also the, uh, the dash require reverse engineering based on the can you, you did mention how you did that process in the dash um, case. So did you have another company do that, the scanning gave you the designs? And then yeah, we, uh, what we did, uh, we used to have a scanner on board uh, a couple of years ago, but we sold that to a company out in California um, for a number of reasons. But now the technologies are more advanced, more compact, um, a bit cheaper, um, and fits in with our CMM and the new partnership. So we're looking to secure a scanner to be able to do that type of work. We did partner with another company to, um, to do this, the reverse engineering of that, and um, they did a very good job. What sort of price point are you looking at for the scanner? Just that that you're talking about. I don't have a budget at this stage, but I'll start at 20 and end at 150. We're looking at two, two different types, two or two different types of segments. Any other questions? <coughs> Thank you very much for your time. I look forward to seeing many of you uh, up at uh, 3D printing on Human Right. Great, thanks, Jeff.